April 1947, Gillies Depot, near Cobalt. The dense woods of Gillies Lake had a stillness to them that felt unnatural, as though the trees themselves were waiting for something. That evening, Elaine and her son David were walking home, the shadows deepening around them. The townsfolk had whispered about Old Yellowtop, the golden furred creature said to haunt these woods, but Elaine had always dismissed it as legend. Tonight, however, the quiet was too heavy, and the wind seemed to carry a secret. Then, from the deepening dusk, a shadow emerged. It was enormous, lurching on two legs, and its fur gleamed a strange yellow in the fading light. Elaine froze, gripping her son's hand, watching as the creature disappeared into the trees. The next morning, Cobalt was abuzz with the sighting, the third in decades. A search party formed, axes and rifles in hand, but after days of hunting, all they found were strange tracks and eerie growls in the night. As the men returned empty-handed, Elaine could not shake the feeling that Old Yellowtop was still watching. Every step along the railway tracks brought a prickle of fear, as though the golden-haired shadow was not yet done haunting the woods of Gillies Lake. May 1976, Humboldt County, California. The road through the Californian forests was quiet, save for the rumble of an old bus carrying exhausted miners. Larry Cormack, slumped in his seat, watched the dark woods pass by when a shout from the back snapped him to attention. There, moving along the roadside, was something big, too big. Its gait was wrong, hunched and loping, like it was struggling to walk upright. Larry had heard of the pre-Cambrian shield man, but dismissed it as folklore, until now. Months later, in May, the woods of Humboldt County became the hunting ground for filmmakers Ed Bush, Terry Gaston, and Cherie Darvell, determined to capture the legendary Bigfoot on camera. Their bait, a mixture of marshmallows and female scent, remained untouched for days, until one night a scream echoed through the valley. Cherie was snatched by a massive, dark figure, her body dragged into the dense forest. The men chased after it, their cameras rolling, but the creature disappeared, leaving behind only deep, strange footprints. When Cherie was found days later, bruised and terrified, she spoke of a hulking beast, though she had never seen its face. The police dismissed it as a hoax, but whispers in the valley lingered, strange sounds and the faint scent of perfume on the wind. Nineteen twenty-five. The icy winds of the Himalayas howled as N.A. Tambazi and his guides ascended toward the towering peak of Kanchenjunga. At 15,000 feet, the air was thin, and the sun's glare off the snow made it hard to see, but when his guide pointed ahead, Tambazi squinted through the brightness. There, moving across the snow, was a figure, tall, human-like, but without clothes, trudging through the snow as though the cold had no hold over it. Tambazi's heart raced. The creature moved with a deliberate gait, tearing bushes from the ground with unsettling ease before vanishing behind a ridge. His guides whispered about the Kanchenjunga demon, a beast feared by locals for generations. But Tombazi, ever the skeptic, pushed aside their superstitions. He investigated the site where the figure had stood, and there, imprinted in the snow, were footprints, too small for a man, but unmistakably bipedal. The prints led into the distance before fading into the endless white. For days, Tombazi was haunted by what he had seen, the image of the creature lodged in his mind like a shadow that would not fade. Years later, he still recalled that strange day when the mountains whispered secrets through the snow and something ancient watched him from the heights of Kanchenjunga. Nineteen eighty-seven, The frozen wilderness of Kamchatka has long been home to some of the largest brown bears in the world but whispers of something far more terrifying have haunted the reindeer herders for generations. They call it the Irkuyem, a massive white-furred beast larger than any bear, with a strange caterpillar-like gait and a reputation for decimating herds. Rodion Sivalobov had spent 10 years searching for this creature, following rumors and collecting stories from those brave enough to speak of it. In 1987, his efforts were rewarded when he obtained a massive pelt, white as the snow itself from local hunters. The fur was thick, and the skull accompanying it hinted at something extraordinary. Perhaps a relic from the Ice Age, a descendant of the ancient Arctodus Simus, the giant short-faced bear of the Pleistocene era. Zoologists in Moscow remained skeptical, dismissing the find as an oversized brown bear or a hybrid. But Sivalobov was convinced. The herders' tales, 
coupled with sightings of the Irkuyam crossing the sea on ice flows, fueled his belief. Though criticized by skeptics, Sivilobov continued his search, gathering more stories of the beast's terrifying encounters with reindeer herders. Some even claimed that the Irkuyam had stalked their lands since the 1960s, a shadow from a time long forgotten lurking beneath the ice. In 1925, N.A. Tombazi's unforgettable encounter provided one of the earliest and most credible Yeti sightings. Tombazi, a photographer and member of the Royal Geographical Society, was exploring near Zimu Glacier when he witnessed something extraordinary. At around 15,000 feet above sea level, he saw a figure moving in the snow, about 200 to 300 yards away. According to Tombazi, the figure was unmistakably human-like, walking upright and occasionally stopping to pull at dwarf rhododendron bushes, but there was something off. It appeared to be completely naked with no visible clothing or gear, which was bizarre given the extreme altitude and freezing conditions. Two hours later, Tombazi and his team investigated the area where the figure had been and discovered footprints. What they found only deepened the mystery. The prints were similar to a human's, but much smaller, only about six to seven inches long and four inches wide. Even more puzzling, the prints clearly belonged to a biped, not an animal that typically roamed those heights. Tombazi's sighting was one of the first to be documented in such detail, and it added a significant amount of credibility to the Yeti legend. After all, this wasn't some local legend, it was a well-respected explorer from a prestigious institution. Fast forward to 1937, when British mountaineer John Hunt, who would later lead the first successful expedition to the summit of Mount Everest, encountered something strange alongside his guide, Pasang Sherpa. While climbing near the Zimu Gap, high above the Zimu Glacier, they stumbled upon unusual footprints. The Sherpas identified them immediately as belonging to a Yeti, and it wasn't just one. They believed the tracks came from a pair of Yetis, a male and a female. Though they didn't see the creatures themselves, the discovery of these footprints in such a remote and harsh environment only added to the growing lore surrounding the Yeti. By 1944, Yeti sightings were becoming more frequent, and one of the most compelling came from C.R. Cook. While hiking near the Singalila Ridge at 14,000 feet, Cook, his wife Margaret, and a group of porters discovered enormous footprints in soft mud. The porters, who called the creature Jungli Admi, wild man, claimed it had crossed the track and climbed up through the bushes from Nepal, continuing its journey up the ridge. Cook described the footprints as unlike anything he had ever seen. Measuring 14 inches from heel to toe with a large great toe set off to the side and three smaller toes bunched together, the prints were far larger and stranger than any normal human foot. To capture the scale, Cook placed his wife's sunglasses next to the prints and took photographs. This encounter, while lacking an actual sighting of the creature, still added to the growing mystique surrounding the Yeti. The size and shape of the footprints were unlike those of any known animal in the region, further blurring the line between legend and reality. What do these sightings tell us? The early 20th century was a time of exploration, discovery, and, in some cases, mystery. As more adventurers climbed the peaks of the Himalayas, they began to bring back more than just stories of dangerous ascents and breathtaking landscapes. The sightings of the Yeti, whether in the form of a distant figure or enormous footprints, captured the imaginations of people worldwide. While skeptics have always been quick to dismiss these sightings as misidentifications of known animals or natural phenomena, the consistency of the reports is hard to ignore. Whether the Yeti is a real creature or just a figment of collective imagination remains up for debate. But one thing is certain, the legend of the Yeti is deeply embedded in the lore of the Himalayas, and sightings like those of Tambazi, Hunt, and Cook have helped keep it alive. Even today, mountaineers and locals still speak of the Yeti in hushed tones. Is it a creature of myth, or is it possible that something ancient and elusive still roams the highest altitudes just out of reach? A guide to understanding the differences between Yeti, Sasquatch, Bigfoot, and more. For years, a determined group of researchers has sought to uncover the elusive Bigfoot, a mysterious creature that has sparked endless fascination, leading to books, films, and dedicated investigations. 
This breakdown explains the key differences between the many names and creatures that have appeared in stories for centuries. Sasquatch. The term Sasquatch is widely recognized as the most respected name for this humanoid figure, believed to be a hybrid of primate and man. The word comes from the Halkomalum language of the Coast Salish people, who lived in the Fraser Valley and parts of Vancouver Island, British Columbia. These areas remain the most frequent locations for reported Sasquatch sightings. Bigfoot is the most popular synonym for Sasquatch. The name originated in 1958 when Gerald Crew, a local worker in Bluff Creek, California, made casts of giant footprints found near his bulldozer. The tracks stirred local interest, and the name Bigfoot was coined by the community. It gained widespread recognition when Humboldt Times editor Andrew Genzoli published the story, stylizing the term as Bigfoot, and the legend grew from there. Today, Bigfoot is the preferred term for enthusiasts, especially those in the Bigfoot Field Researchers Organization, also known as BFRO. While often lumped together with Sasquatch, the Yeti is a separate creature with roots in Eastern traditions. Known primarily in the Himalayan mountain region, the Yeti is thought to be an Arctic beast, often described more as a bear than an ape. Unlike the Sasquatch, who thrives in temperate regions, the Yeti is believed to be a cold-dwelling entity. Himalayan peoples revered this being, referring to it as the glacier being, and including it in pre-Buddhist worship rituals. In 1921, Henry Newman, a reporter for The Statesman, coined the term abominable snowman after interviewing members of a British expedition to Mount Everest. They described large footprints, which their local guides attributed to a creature called Meadow Kang Mi. While Kang Mi means snowman, Newman mistranslated meadow, which means man bear, as filthy. Disliking the term filthy, he changed it to abominable and the name stuck. The abominable snowman, synonymous with the Yeti, remains a figure of lore in the Himalayan region, distinct from Sasquatch sightings in the West. These creatures, despite some similarities, each come from different cultural backgrounds and climates, embodying distinct legends and characteristics. By Bert Strand, Outdoor Editor, Standard Examiner, April 12, 1977. South Weber. In a curious development, two Ogden men claim to have found what might be strands of hair from the legendary creature Bigfoot. The men, Michael Sanders and Steve Yukina, both local residents, said they encountered the mysterious creature just over a week ago in a rural area near South Weber. Sanders, who resides in Ogden, explained that the pair had been tracking what they believed to be two Bigfoot-like creatures. Their pursuit led them to a barbed wire fence where Sanders discovered three strands of black hair snagged on the wire. The Utah Division of Wildlife Resources is currently analyzing the hair to determine its origin. We've lived in this area all our lives, Sanders said, and we know the land well. According to Sanders, the tracks left by the creatures had an unusual gorilla-like quality, leading him to believe that a larger creature had become separated from a smaller companion, which might explain why the creatures lingered in the area. The men followed the tracks south toward the mountains near Weber Canyon, but ultimately lost the trail when the snow began to melt on a hillside. One interesting incident occurred near the home of Walter G. Ray, a resident of South Weber. Ray reported that his wife had placed a burnt pan of stew on their back porch to cool, only for it to be dragged 100 yards into their garden during the night. The pan was found licked clean the next morning, with strange tracks around it. I didn't think much of it at first, Ray said. Until these fellows came by and pointed out the tracks, they looked like large bear tracks, complete with footpads. Ray also noted that his dog, usually alert to disturbances, acted unusually calm the night the pan disappeared. Adding to the oddness, a Mountain Green resident reported a terrible odor around his home recently, comparing it to a mix of skunk and something unwashed for a long time. His dogs, which normally bark at any sign of deer, remained eerily silent during the time the odor was present. Several others in the community have reported similar experiences, all mentioning a pungent smell accompanying the sightings of the mysterious creature. Meanwhile, Bigfoot hunters from Oregon and other states have descended upon the South Weber area, eager to find more evidence. 
Reports claim that footprints as large as 18 inches long with five distinct toes have been discovered, with some witnesses describing a stride of up to 10 feet. Local residents Pauline Markham and Rodney Smith also shared their encounters. Markham reported seeing the creature from about half a mile away, walking along a ridge toward the Davis Weber Canal. Smith described a moonlit glimpse of the creature as it moved through the snow, emitting a growl reminiscent of a mountain lion. The mystery continues as enthusiasts search the Weber Canyon area for more clues. The last Bigfoot sighting in the region occurred three years ago when two men and a group of teenagers claimed to have encountered the creature near the head of the Weber River in the Uinta Mountains. Though the hair found by Sanders is under analysis, the question remains, has Bigfoot truly made its mark on Utah soil? Or will this simply be another unsolved mystery? As the whispers of the forest faded, the legends of Bigfoot remained, etched into the memories of those who encountered it. Survivors spoke of glowing eyes, massive footprints, and haunting calls in the night. Others kept their silence, the terror too deep to share. Yet one question lingered, was it a beast or a guardian of the unknown? If you enjoyed the journey through these chilling tales, please like, subscribe, and share your thoughts in the comments below.